Awesome. <clears throat> so just one more time again, we're on Facebook Live, so if you just want to see all the video and all the fun and everything else to, in between, uh, we encourage you to go there. So let's talk about email, okay? I've been in the email space for, for quite some time. Uh, I would say probably eight years, seven or eight years. I've been doing testing. I've been doing a lot of speaking. Um, I've, I've been to all the different conferences like um, Salesforce Connections, which used to be Exact Target Connections. Um, and and I've, I've, I've really come to love this topic. But today, I want to share with you some things that I've learned recently that have created some fundamental shifts in me. And, but at the, you know, so for those that have been following me, um, I actually have some things that I'm really excited to talk to you about today in these six strategies. But ultimately, whether you've been following email, whether you're just getting into it, um, whether you know a lot or know a little, today you're going to get six strategies that you can use to help you raise more funds. That's the bottom line, because that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we need to do to keep our causes moving, keep our causes alive. So, without further ado, let's address this issue. Uh, wait, 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 isn't email dead, right? Have you heard somebody say that? Have you been to a conference lately where somebody's like, guys, listen, email is totally going to be dead by 2020, right? And these people are just, they're going out there, they're writing the blog posts, they're writing the articles. We, it didn't, it wasn't very hard for us to do an internet search to find these different things. And then you have some people saying, well, wait a minute, why should I not be working on this? Why shouldn't I be like doing some snappies? Why shouldn't I be doing some YouTubes? Or why shouldn't I be creating a YouTube star or something, right? Because this is, these, these seem to be the things that the, kid, you know, the, the young generations are flocking towards, especially now more than ever. Well, I first want to address that because it, we can't really get into email without us understanding and remembering why it's so important to get into. Okay, so first thing, you look at some of the quotes from some of the, the you know, the research in, um, in institutions and, and people that are actually going out there and looking, what they're finding is what we're seeing also, is that email is, is significantly better than some of these other channels at acquiring customers, straight up. Or in our case, getting donations, right? And it's not just McKinsey, uh, you've got another uh, institution here, you've got another group where they've discovered that marketers are consistently ranking email as the single most effective tactic for awareness, acquisition, conversion, and retention, right? So, um, and you know, and if you get into uh, what we're going to introduce later in our course, if you watch that first session, you're gonna find some actual nonprofit data showing just how important the email channel is for revenue, how much money is being allocated to the email channel, which in most cases is just about all of it or most of it for the online portion of the fundraising, right? Um, and there's another thing that, that I really want to, to cover here, and, and that's this, is that, you know, the boomers, right, the baby boomers, who represent the majority of giving, okay, um, they're, 43% of total giving is by boomers. And what you guys don't realize is one of the things that they love to do, they love television, they love search, and they love email, okay? So if you take a look here, DMN3 did a study, which marketing channel is the most effective to reach baby boomers, right? And we define effective by the popularity. The answer, email marketing, was right on the list. So, you know, when you think about the type of people that are, that are giving right now, the type of people that we're reaching, okay, they are using email, they're relying on email, they love email. Email is part of their day, okay? Email is something that they look to. So, I want you to think, this is all about that we got to make sure we got to make sure that we're focusing on the right people. We got to make sure we're focusing on the right audience. And for the boomers, email is definitely where it's at. So let's get to the six strategies. Um, but first, uh, let's let's start with a test. Okay, this is a nonprofit running a campaign. Okay, to get support for uh, there's some kind of a budget contest. Uh, it's a political thing. So there's a political thing going on. Um, I, th I believe in the state of Illinois. Okay, and this is one of those policy groups that's trying to influence that. Okay, so I just want you to focus on the experiment. Okay, we, the, the, what it exactly they're doing is not as important. Okay, and I want to show you one of the two versions of the email. Okay, here's version A. Okay, version A. You can see um, pretty straightforward. It's text only actually, so um, you know, you don't see a lot of these, it seems like sometimes, but you know, I hope your week is going well. This week, a group of Illinois state senators, so you can see what we're referring to there. It's kind of an issue going on there. 
and they want to intervene. You read that right. Here's what's going on. You know, we believe the Illinois are hungry for this kind of reform, etc., etc. Make a donation. Um, here's a link. Okay. Now let's take a look at version B. Doesn't look very much different, actually. Um, not much different at all. Uh, well, let's just put them side by side, make it easier. Okay, so I am seeing a few, I, I am seeing some minor text differences. Make this line here, this line here. Um, you know, um, when, you, when you read the copy, it's about the same, it's the same subject, it's the same topic, it's the same things. My question to you is, which one is actually going to result in more? Which one is going to result in more donations, if at all? Okay, because remember, we're fundraising here. We're trying to raise funds. We're trying to figure out how can we inspire people to be more generous, okay? So I, I just want you to think about that for a moment, version A or version B. For those of you, for those of you that had voted for version B, you're correct. Maybe it was out of hunch, but there's 328% increase in donations and not just donations there's a 91 percent increase in average gift can you imagine the significant difference in revenue that this version created rather than the other one amazing right but to me like that's not a lot of difference i mean they look the same look look they look the same they look very much the same i mean there's just very little text difference right so how is it that such a small difference could have such a disproportionately large difference on donor behavior. The reason why I chose this email is because this email was one of the few that really got under my skin. I want to figure out why, because I want to duplicate it so that I can teach you how to duplicate it, right? <clears throat> well, let me show you, let me tell you why. It has a little something to do with this. We call it social presence. Actually, we don't call it that. There are researchers that call it that, um, for specific. Let me, let me help you define what social presence is. You're like, social presence, what does that mean? How does this email have social presence, right? Well, a guy named Dr. B.J. Fogg, you may have heard of him. He did a lot of research into this um, about persuasive technology, uh, you know, how people interact with technology, how they interact with computers, how they interact with various digital devices, you know. And what he had discovered, he ran his own experiments, of course, in addition to his meta-analyses that he did of everybody else's work. He ran his own work, and what he discovered is that human beings are hardwired. They're hardwired to respond to cues in the environment, especially to things that seem alive. Now, you're thinking things that seem alive. You're thinking like a Teletubby or something, right? You're thinking some kind of a toy. But this actually holds true in the words that we read especially on the computers or the iPads or the digital devices that we have, right? And the examples that he gave in terms of cues, right? Social cues. He gave into these one, two, three, four, five categories, okay? So physical, psychological, language, social dynamics, social rules. So, for example, you know, <clears throat> if someone reads some copy or reads something and they feel like they're in kind of, they're, it's like a teacher or a doctor, they're going to respond differently. They're going to respond as if there's a doctor. Um, turn taking, right? Praise for good work. People are like, they're responding to these things, like as if these digital, these computers are alive, right? As if they're real people. Interactive language, preferences, humor. I'm sorry, you know, when a computer, you know, expresses some personality, people are responding to that, right? People are looking for these things. Now, bearing all of this in mind, question that I have for you is, let's take a look at that email. Are any of these things present? Let's move it over and take a look. I've highlighted all of the words, all of the phrases that are in this treatment that are not in the original. And when you look at this winner again, you're going to start to see some of this interactive language, some of this praise for good work, some of this turn taking, some of this, you know, uh, this social role, okay? Let's look at it in detail. I wanted to get this news to you as soon as I could, right? Who would, you know, that, that sounds like something that a person would write. It sounds almost kind of urgent, right? But now the fight begins, okay? So it's more than just an, a contest. It's like a fight, okay? There, there, 
it's, the copy is translating it into something a little bit deeper. This, that's where you can help turn up the heat. Now we're going into social roles a little bit, okay? In addition, would you be able to help us? They're, we're asking them directly to get involved, okay? An incredible impact, desperately. We desperately need a balanced budget. I'd be honored if you joined us, right? Thank you for standing. Praise for good work. Are you guys beginning to see some of the clues in this email? Some of the social cues, right? And it's about the same thing, right? And yet, it produced that gain. Which goes on to teach us that not just in this one, but in many other experiments, in fact, throughout this whole webinar, you're going to find that people will treat purely digital experiences like their experiences with real people. That is one of the most important lessons that I've learned over all of these years of working in email, especially working in any kind of a digital optimization. Because here's the thing, people will give to people, not email machines, right? When somebody senses that there's a person writing that email, or they sense some kind of personality behind that email, right? They're more inclined to give. Why? Because people give to people. They don't give to machines. You don't just give your money to an ATM. In fact, if that was the only way to give, you'd still be a little bit weary. You'd rather go and give it to the person, right? Unless you've been really tech savvy. Does that make sense? So here's the thing. We did a meta-analysis of all the different experiments in our library. We've got a thousand plus now. Really awesome. Um, <clears throat> there were about 218 different experiments that formed the meta-analysis and the findings behind this particular session. And these are all statistically significant. They were done properly. And we wanted to, we, we went back through these a number of times to try and understand the impact of social cues, right? And how to integrate them into the fundraising appeals. And the result, of course, is this webinar. And this is actually a preview of a session in an entire email course that we've created for you that we're going to talk about at the very end of this. So here's what I want to do by the end of this session. I want to help you understand how to adjust each major element in your email donation appeal to foster a one-to-one -one style communication, the type of communication that's going to help somebody sense that there's somebody there that's going to want to inspire them to be more generous, okay? Because that's really, we, got, we have to remember the goal here is donations and generosity. We're not just going, we're not trying to get quick clicks, we're not just trying to get quick exposure, we're trying to inspire generosity. Okay? And we're going to go through six different things as a result of this analysis that you can do. You don't even have to be great at email. You could have tried other things too, but you want to hang on for all six of these things. So, this sounds simple, right? You know, but it's not easy, right? So here's what we're going to do. How do we get started? The first thing we're going to do, so here's all of our six things, okay? Right here. So that way you know it's coming, okay? Nothing scary here, guys. Nothing out of the ordinary. Um, nothing scary. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with the, the biggest one, the one that everybody has questions about, and that's design and format. Okay? So most times when people think of design, email design, they, think, they might think of something like this, right? They might think of this nice little template and this wonderful, you know, look at all these graphics. It's got to look good. It's, look, it's almost like a landing page, right? Okay? You know, they might think of something like this and they'll say, yep, this is what email should look like. This is what I see the big brands using. This is what I should be doing. But then sometimes you might see other variations of this. You might see, you know, a lighter variation of this. So you still got image here, you got logo. You might have a navigation, I don't know. You definitely have your footer. You have a big call to action button. So you still have the graphics, right? And then of course, on the other side of the extreme, it's got all text, okay? Here's a question I get all the time. Which is the correct design? Which is the correct design for fundraising? Which is the correct design just in general? Which one should I be doing? You know, right? Because maybe you're tired of watching and seeing what everybody else is doing. What does the data say? Well, let me tell you, that is the wrong question to ask. You need to ask a different question before you can get the answer to that one. The question that you really need to be asking is this. How does email design affect people? That is by far the most important question that we need to ask, right? So let me, let me get into what I mean with this example. Okay, I want you to take a look at this picture. I, guys, I just pulled it off the internet. You can find it right here, photo credit here. Okay, uh, I don't know if this was a setup or if it was real, but let me take a look at this guy. He's like, what is going on, right? 
what do you think of when you look at this picture? Right? I just want, I just want you to imagine for a moment. What is it that you think of? You know? Maybe you think of something suspicious. Maybe you're like, I don't know, man. This guy, he's, he looks he's a character, right? Well, why? Why, is he, why does he maybe raise an eyebrow with you? Why is he raising this guy's eyebrow, right? I mean, this guy's body language is totally given away. Like, he, he totally doesn't know what to think of this guy, right? You know? I, I think he's even reading a paper upside down. <laughs> That's what it looks like, right? Well, I don't know about you, but when I look at a picture like that, I think of suspicious. I think of, okay, there's something going on with this guy. You know what I mean? There's, there's definitely something going on with this guy. You know, I don't know. I, want, I might want to keep my distance, right? Because he's dressed a certain way. He's, he's, you know, whether there is or isn't, there's kind of an expectation. There's some kind of an impression that exists in our mind, some kind of bias. And we look at that guy, we're like, that doesn't fit. That doesn't fit for the kind of normal, safe situation that I'm used to, right? Well, here's the thing. The same thing is true for email, okay? In people, in, in email, people still pro subliminally prioritize messages that appear to be personally written, okay? So, you know, here's the thing. When, when somebody goes in their email box, okay, and they see an email that actually looks like it was written by a real person, they have this bias that exists in here already that says, you know what? I think this is safer. I think, it, I think this is something that, you know what? I, I could connect with. They have a bias, but when they see something that's heavily designed, maybe like, wait a minute, maybe this is an ad, you know? Not to say that all ads are bad. We like, to, you know, I kind of like to go into email and look for an ad every now and then, but ads are for different things, right? Especially not for fundraising. Here's the thing. Real people send text-based emails, not HTML emails. Okay? And because real people send text-based emails and HTML emails, then the design is going to have, too much design is going to have a negative effect because of that bias. And you should be aware of that before you write, you know, you put your, together your next fundraising email. And if you don't believe me, let me show you a few examples. Okay? There's this term that I had to learn, it's called money bomb. It's like some kind of like high urgency campaign uh, in the fundraising world, right? Well, um, in this case, you could see same content, right? You got a little more design here, a lot less, but they didn't take it all away. They still have a logo, still have a button, still have a signature. It's the same guy though, guys. It's the same guy um, that, that signed it, wrote it, and everything. The result, by just stripping out a lot of those graphics, not only an increase in clicks, but a significant increase. That's what we care about, donations. Wow, okay, just by toning down the design to better match that expectation or that bias that people believe that Real people send text-based emails. The next thing, okay, here we've got, okay, we've got a fundraising appeal that has a graphics, this, that. You know what they did is they stripped all of that out and went straight to the text. The result, significant increase in response. Another one, okay, let's just put fundraising aside. What if you're just trying to get people, trying to get their email address? You're trying to, you know, expand their engagement. Even so, when we took out all of the design, and just put the text in there. The result, significant increase in response. Free book offer, you know, and if, if this isn't enough, again, same thing, significant increase in response. Even a stewardship email where you're just trying to thank your donors, right? Getting rid of this, getting rid of this. The result, significant increase in response. At least 20% to me is significant, right? That's 20% more people that are paying attention to what you're saying and that are more likely to give in the future because you did say thank you. That's another webinar, that's last January, check it out, okay? So what does this mean? What does all of this mean, okay? When it comes to email design, if you are asking for a donation, what I would recommend is you simulate a one-to-one -one appeal. We all know that when you sit down across from a person and you have a conversation with them and you just are honest and genuine, you're more likely to get their attention and to inspire their generosity. But we don't have the money and the time to go meet every single donor on our list. So how can we simulate that? We can simulate that by the way in which we design our email. So is the email you're sending making a personal request or invitation? If so, think about the design. Is it too much? Is there any design, if there's any design left over, is it still authentic, right? So you notice that first example, like, you know, it was still, it still had a not more of an authentic feel. It didn't have that big banner because people don't put big banners in their emails, okay? They don't, right? Logo probably maybe, but not a big banner. Does that make sense? So 
Now that, we've, now that we've talked about the email design format, we talked about how design affects people. We understand what we can do. We're going to go ahead and just stick to a text-based design for the duration of this, and we're going to talk about each of these other elements. Let's now talk about a salutation, and that's generally this, this first part right up here. Another question I get, how important is it to begin personally? Well, well what do you mean by that too, John? Well, I'll just I'll use a case study to help you see. Okay. Here you go. Can anybody notice the difference? What's the difference between these two? Everything is exactly the same except one thing. Just take a look. Well, if you guess the name, you got it, right? Hi, Jeff. <laughs> the name. Anybody wonder why it's so important to collect the name? I'll, I'll give you 270 <laughs> reasons why. 270% uh, increase in, in clicks just by including a name. Uh, this can have a tremendous impact. Uh, that's how important it is to begin personally, right? Because real people address emails to specific people, right? We're going back to the beginning again. It's about people, were, they're looking for social cues, right? They're looking for something that says, ah, this is a person, because that's how we're going to inspire generosity, right? Now, don't stop at a name, you know? I, you know, you can take advice from Dale, right? Classic person's name is the sweetest and most important sound in any language, that's great. I don't want you to stop there. Don't just stop at their name. The answer to this question is no. Why? Think about the word salutation. I'm not going to get too deep here. This is, go to Google and you're going to find this. Okay, go to Google. All I want to say is that the origin of this is about paying one's respects. It's about acknowledging them or acknowledging their situation, right? We think of this term, phrase, we think of like funerals. But I want you to think of it, don't, don't think of it that way. I want you to think of acknowledgement, okay? What does it mean to pay your respect to somebody? It means, what does it mean to respect somebody when you talk to them? It means to acknowledge their situation in some way, shape, or form, right? So, here are a number of different ways you can acknowledge somebody, right? Even an email, okay? You can acknowledge your interests. Even biases, if you know the type of personality of the type of donor that, that speaks out to you, okay? You know? Um, their communication style, their level of engagement. These are things that you might have, you have a little bit more data, but even if you don't have a ton of data, you can still acknowledge like things that are going on around them, like cold weather even, recent events, recent actions that they've taken. All these things are just clues about the life that they're leading, okay? The story that they're going through. And, and here's the thing, you know, I've always said that there's a story behind everything that's bought. I also believe that there's a story behind every donation, right? There's a story behind every, you know, every click and every engagement, like there's, you know, people are looking for clues. They're looking for things to help them get, take the next step in life. They're looking to, to advance their values, their principles. They're looking for connection. They're looking for similarity. Okay. They're, 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 in fact, I would argue that they're, they're scanning your emails looking for these very things. Okay. If you have the ability, the technology to segment your emails, even just basically, okay. Um, Donors, non-donors, okay? If you have the ability to do that, regions, then you should use it because that is a form of acknowledgement. If you can segment and then address them specifically. Give me an example. Tim gave me this example. Um, February 1, 2011, really cold where Tim was at. Um, and, um, you know, he was going through his email box. And how do you think he felt when he got this email? You see it? <laughs> Summer is right around the corner. Uh, I call fill in the blank. No, it, it's not right around the corner. Okay, do you, do you, do you, see, you ever yelled at an advertisement or yelled at something or yelled in your head and you're like, are you kidding me? Okay, this is somebody responding to this in a negative way socially, right? You know, it's like somebody who's like in shorts when it's snowing outside. You look at that person and you're like, what? Okay, it's the same thing in email. It happens, okay? But here's the thing, on the same day, okay, in the same day, Tim also got this email. And look at the beginning. Burr, did you make it to work today? I did after an icy two-hour commute. If you didn't, I bet the work is just piling up. And that's where the acknowledgement ends and it goes into their pitch. But here's the thing, did Tim read it? Absolutely. Why? Because there was a form of acknowledgement that he could relate to immediately. And all of a sudden, he felt like these guys had a much stronger connection to him, even though they just completely went into their pitch. He has selected this example. He wanted me to show it to you guys. And I, I think it holds true. I think it makes a really good point, right? 
Real people start relevant conversations. If you're having a real conversation with somebody, if, that's, if we're trying to create that social cue, right, where we're trying to help people see a person behind the email, right, you know, we can help do that by inserting some form of relevance, okay, even on a broad basis to start that conversation, right? Because, you know, we do small talk, right? We do small talk in real life, you know. We come up and say, hey, how's the weather? You know, we, small talk helps build relationships, but small talk is always centered around relevance. So don't forget a proper salutation. What does this mean? It means when it comes to email salutation, if you have the technology, if you have the ability to do it, do it. Use their name. Look for any external relevance cues, any actions, anything that's going, anything that's happening in the news. Okay, all of these things only serve to, to make your conversation stronger with them. Ask yourself when you write your email, have you tried any internal relevance cues too? Ask yourself that. Does that make sense? Great. So now that we've talked about design and format and salutation, okay, we're almost halfway through, let's talk about one of the first fundamental shifts that I've made in my eight years in doing email. And we're going to talk about the body copy. Okay. This is, um, by the way, if you're looking at this template, this is just a plain HubSpot template. We have a resource um, that, that Nathan has actually created for you based on the research. It's a little bit more detailed than this. Okay. So if you, if you just happen to have a basic template, just that's all that this is. It, don't read too much into it. Okay. Let's talk about body copy and I want to look at four experiments. Okay. And here's what I want to do. I want to look for common denominators. I want you to look for a pattern among these four experiments because I'm really excited what I'm about to talk about okay, and how it's changed my point of view in terms of writing emails right, for the donation, for the, for the end conversion. Let's look at the first one. Okay? Experiment number 106. All right? let, me, let me explain this. On the left here, we have short email, long landing page. So it's the same information, same appeal. It's just, we just try to get them here. We try to get them here to make the, to make the sell, right? On the right, oh my goodness, really long email, okay? No learn, you know, no learn more. This is, um, and then really short landing page. What do you guys think? Left or right? Well, the one on the right, even though it had a 50% decrease in clicks, it had a massive 44% increase in donations. And that's not from the people that clicked. That's from the people that even received the email in the first place. So we're talking major revenue difference. 44% increase in donations. One example. Let's go to two. Here we go. Dear friend, Americans, so you can see this. That all-important task, click here to find out what it is. Dear friend, it goes into the thing. Okay. More copy. Result. Oh, by the way, don't forget the PS. Sorry. Significantly more clicks here. Massive increase in donations on the other side and an increase in average gift to boot. Okay, example two. We're almost done. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you've ever encountered a 2,200 word email in your life. But if you haven't, today is the day, right? 550 words versus 2,200. What was the result? 106% increase in donations. Massive difference, okay? Massive difference. And last one, number 391. On the left, dear John, most people are familiar with, okay, so you can get that long email. Would you help grow the kingdom this year with an investment? Short email. Let me show you how it can, okay, the result, massive increase in clicks, no difference in donations, but uh, we still lost money, 40% decrease in average gift. Are you guys seeing a pattern? Is anybody seeing a pattern here? You know, if you were to ask me, it looks like the uh, longer email seemed to be uh, hashtag winning, right? Sorry, a little, that's a little corny. I had to do it. Um, they're winning. So that's gonna, this is, where is this gonna lead? Okay, John, so how long should my copy be, right? You're like, okay, John, I'm ready. Just tell me, tell me what to do. Wrong question. Don't ask that yet. Let, ask, the, ask this question first. Ask this question. How is copy length influencing the reader's decisions? Okay, this is so important. This is the first of two major common denominators in each of the winning treatments, 
okay? This is the first of the two. And here it is. Each of these longer winning emails answers this question better. This is the first, this is the first of two major common denominators. Pay attention to this. Each of the longer emails does this. The ones that got the best donation and money results. If I am your ideal supporter, why should I donate to you rather than continue my day? Straightforward, right? Straightforward. Why was it that the longer emails did a better job of answering this than the shorter emails? Simply because they actually tried to answer the question. None of the shorter emails tried to answer the question thoroughly. Incompleteness, okay? Because real people give enough reason for their requests before they make it. And you know what I've discovered? Is that people are making their decisions earlier in the process than we actually think. Okay, let's take a look on an organizational level. Okay, here are two emails, they look very similar. But what if I told you that the one on the right here has more text, so it does have more text. And I'm gonna zoom in on the text, on the, on the additional text, okay? Right, let's zoom in. 26.7% increase in donations, by the way. So this was the winner. Let's look at it. When I first started writing in my CaringBridge journal, I didn't know it was a nonprofit organization, but then I began to experience the benefit of CaringBridge. It helped keep my loved ones close during an extremely difficult time, and I became a donor. I love the fact that there are no ever so we're talking about the benefit of the cause, the organization, what it is that they provide, free websites for people who are sick that want to communicate things and not use something like Facebook. It's secure, you know, it's personalized, it's great. And it didn't stop there. One thing I know for sure is that every mom in a situation like mine should be able to use CaringBridge to find support. This is value proposition. This is helping answer the question, why should I donate to you rather than not donate to you or donate at all? This is answering the question in the email. In the email. 26.7% increase. And in fact, all four of these winners that you see over here, all four, one, two, three, four, they all dedicate the answer in the email. It all happens in the email, okay? So that brings me back to my question. So how long, John? Long, John, nice. How long then, John, should my copy be, right? How long should my copy be, right? Because you want me to answer that question. Well, let me answer it for you this way. It should be long enough to give enough reason to that question. Why should I donate to you? You need to answer that question in the email. You cannot wait to a landing page to answer it, okay? Do you have enough copy in the email to clearly express the value proposition? Okay, the value proposition is the answer to that question. Second, do you have enough copy to answer the question, why do I want to participate in this? Okay, and then third, do you have enough copy to answer the question, why would I believe this would make an impact? These are all three very, very important questions you need to ask. So, the question is, is if you can answer each of these three questions clearly in your email, then that is enough copy, okay? But if you haven't, make sure you take the time to add that little bit if you want to attract the end result, if you want to attract a donation and a conversion, okay? Make sense? Very big fundamental shift that I'm making because if you, if you followed me, I just want to get the click. just want to get the click. And you know what? We're going to talk about that in the next section. Because we just finished the body copy, now we're going to go into the call to action. And you know what? This is the second. This is the second of the two major common denominators. So this is the second major shift that I've had to make in my practice in email. The question was, was what was the second major common denominator in each of these winning treatments? Well, I'm going to give that to you right now. The second one was that each of the emails, each and every single one of these emails that got a significant increase in donations compared to the other one, provided this a very clear destination. Make a donation now. I am not trying to get you to find out more. I'm not trying to get you to click. I am trying to help you understand what my intention is. This is my intention. I want you to donate. When you go to the landing page, you will not find something different. This is what you will find, right? So let's take a look. Some more experiments. Number 583. On the left, the only thing that's, you know, we, we see a fundamental difference. Please make your year-end gift. On the right, stand with us. Oh, stand up for your values. It is not clear what we're getting at. We want to get the click. 
Did we get the click? Absolutely. But you know what? We tanked in donations. 50% decrease in donations by trying that approach. Another one, okay? Here's our, our gift to you in thanks for a donation, okay? Right there. In this one, it is not clear. It's like, get your free copy. What do you think happened? Oh yeah, I totally got the clicks, but guess what? I was approaching validity and a decrease in donations. Here's another one. You can securely give your gift or you can find out more. What was the result? Oh, I got the clicks, but man, look at the donations. I'm, on a, I'm approaching validity for a statistically significant decrease in donations. Do you want to run that email if you're trying to fundraise? Oh, and one more. If you're not trying to fundraise, let's just say you're trying to get people to sign up in a rented list for one of your free offers so you can collect their email. Learn more, activate your free course now. The result, 25.9% increase in emails. The end result, that's what we're looking for, not the clicks. Listen guys, not all clicks are created equal. All clicks are not created equal. That is one of the fundamental shifts, one of the big things that I've learned in going through all of these new case studies and all of these new experiments. And you know what that means? It teaches me that action ready readers want to know where your email is leading before they will proceed because they want to make the decision in the email. The action ready readers, okay? These guys right here. The guys that we care about, the ones that we want to, that, that we want to inspire, to tip them over the edge, to, to, to indulge in their generosity. They want to know where you're going. They want to know what you're up to. They want to know where you're leading. And guess what? They're not going to click on that bait. Other everybody else is going to click, but they're not the ones that are going to donate. Because real people are clear about their intentions and requests. Do you see how that ties back to the social cues? Right? And does that make sense? I mean, how do you feel if, if you feel like somebody's leading you one way and then they change and lead the other? The funny thing about email is that there's just as much power with the sender as there is with the message. Right? The sender carries power. Okay? It's not necessarily up to the landing page to lift it all anymore. The sender actually has a say. And, it, and it, you know, it's true in life. You know, if I've got one person saying something to me and another person saying something to me, you know, sometimes I'm gonna listen to the person that I give more value to. And that's the wonderful thing about email, it's permission-based. We've given them permission to talk to us, to speak into our lives. I guess you could stretch it that far, right? It's the same thing here. And it's reflected in your call to action. Now, some people ask, let's go back to the design question. Well, does the format matter, right? Does the format matter? Well, yeah, take a look. Here's just a link. It's, you know, this is hyperlinked, so they could just click it, right? And then you got a completely raw, like HTTPS colon slash slash. Which one do you think got more response? Are you kidding me? John, this has to be a fluke. John, you, this got to be a typo. Go look it up, 490, 4980, okay? Listen, why is it that this email on the right could produce such a dramatic difference? Because real people copy and paste raw links into their emails, okay? Not phrases that are hyperlinked. Very few people, like even I had to, <laughs> I had to teach myself how to do that, right? Okay, it might look a little cleaner but again, it kind of sets something off in somebody. We're trying to scale that one-to-one -one relationship, remember? Well, well, what about additional calls to action above the fold? Above the fold, above the fold, above the fold, above the fold. I always hear above the fold, okay? What does this image make you think of, make you feel like? This has got to be the worst nightmare possible. If you, if you want to give yourself a cringe-worthy kind of experience, go online and look at failed proposals and watch those videos. Guys, it is wrenching. But you, listen, you know, the person that's making proposal, I mean, come on, like, you know, did they, did they, unless the person was like really being deceived, were they really paying attention to the other person? And that's what the, that's the thing here, that's the thing here, right? Okay, what I've discovered is that we can put a call to action above the fold, and guess what, we can get an increase in clicks. And I could show you two or three experiments right now, but you know what? I have no evidence to suggest that they're going to increase my donations. Why? Because real people give enough information before they ask them to make a real decision. Okay? If you ask them to make a decision first without giving them enough information, you're going to start backing your way in. And you know what? You're in a defensive position. Now, they're thinking about the weight that you have. They're thinking about saying yes based on their relationship with you 
and nothing else, okay? They don't have enough reason. And we know from those experiments that even if they're your donors and they've been your donors for a while, they still need to know, especially in, a, in the format of email, they still need some form of reason, some value proposition. They still need a reason, okay? We cannot ignore this. Real people, real people give enough information before making a real decision. So what does this all mean when it comes to call to action? Of the two things of the fundamental shifts that I've made as an as a email practitioner myself, it's this, when it comes to the call to action, if you want the conversion, you want the donation, you want the purchase, okay, at the end, okay, you need to be 100% clear about where you're going, okay? Are you presenting your call, first call to action too early? Is it in a raw link format? Is it clear, okay? Now, if you just want to get exposure to an article, you just want people to read, you can totally do the learn more. You can totally use that mystery to get them in. You know what? That's cool. But for people that are trying to make a decision, they're in their email inboxes, they're about getting ready to back out of your email, they're looking to see what this is all about. They're not just going to click and then browse. The serious people want to know right then and there. So if that's who you're trying to reach, you need to choose your call to action appropriately. Okay, we're almost done. The next one, which I love, this, okay, this goes back, this is one of those things that, that even I grew in my learnings in the last you know, year or so, like I love this part. You're gonna love this, this is tone and voice, okay? Even in the HubSpot template, they, even they have an instinct, right? You know, for tone and voice, right? But let's set the record straight. What are we supposed to do? What are we not supposed to do? How does this affect what it is that we're trying to accomplish, okay? You remember from the introduction, we talked about this experiment, version A, version B, and then version B, oh my goodness, massive difference, right? If you remember, I even showed you key emotive language additions, right? Each of these things served as like social cues. They kind of, they started to make you feel, they started to make you kind of see that there's a personality in this, in this whole kind of request, right? And even, we even help them understand their role better, right? So all of this is, all goes back to what we talked about in the beginning. Okay, so the question is, is how could this add up to such a monumental difference? Because that's the thing that perplexed me. And it wasn't just this email. There's like two or three other emails. It would be hard for me to show them to you because we'd have to literally read them line by line for you to see. Okay? But this is, this is one thing that really struck me. Here's the thing. The reason why it made such a big difference is because real people are not all logic and reason. They're not all Vulcan. Okay, they're not all Mr. Spock, right? A little throwback there for all of you Star Trek fans, okay? They're not all Vulcan, they're not all Spock, they're not all logic and reason, okay? And for those of you, um, you know, we have to remember that we spend so much time learning to communicate to the conscious mind that we forget how to communicate to the unconscious mind, okay? Is anybody a fan of a guy called Simon Sinek? You know, he was the one responsible for the, um, I guess it was the video that broke the internet on his take on millennials. You guys have probably watched that where he talked about their situation. But before he made that video, before he made that book, Leaders Eat Last, he came up with this great, wonderful TED Talk that shot off his career, and it's about the golden circle. Uh, based on his book, um, you know, Start With Why. And one of the things that he discovered in his, his own research that helped him to come to this conclusion on why you should start with why is that this thing called the limbic brain, which is the, you know, which is the center most part, it's, it's the thing in which is responsible for all of our feelings, trust and loyalty, okay? This thing is also responsible for our decision making and it has no capacity for language. So the reason why he says start with why is because when you answer the question of why you exist, what it is that you're doing, you answer that question, you begin to touch on those feelings. You begin to touch on the things that move people. It's like when you watch a movie. It's not the fact that it's in space that makes you excited or makes you love the movie. It's the story. My wife and I just finished watching Coco. We're like, why did it win some Emmy awards? But we watched it and we're like, oh man, that was so good, right? It wasn't the fact that it was this really interesting setting. Don't get me wrong, it was very interesting, very well done. What I remembered was the emphasis on the values and the family. It's a, the heartstrings, right? Okay, that's what Simon Sinek is talking about, okay? I don't have, it's not easy for me to describe. Now the question is, is do people feel that when they read your emails? Do they feel a connection to that when they read what you're, read, what you're saying, okay? Well, this explains why, right? We added some images here on the right, okay? Okay, and guess what? It didn't do anything. 
I thought images helped. Okay, we did it again. We add another image. Okay, this is of the, you know, what did it do? It didn't do anything. But yet when we add an image here, oh my gosh, massive increase in donations. So how is it that I can add an image in one email, but I, and it doesn't do anything, but I can add an image in another email and it completely just blows up the donations. I want to know how to do it. Well, guess what? I figured it out. Let me show you. In this particular email, I want you to forget about the cause for a moment and I want you to think a little bit about you know, the technique here. They describe the situation right here. Baronelle is a humble grandmother. And you know what? For this particular audience, they were talking, they, they were, you know, they wanted to draw attention. They felt like this person was being picked on. Okay? Straight up. All right? Put the cause aside and, and look at what's going on. But here's the thing. It wasn't enough to read it. When they actually saw who the person was, they're like, oh my gosh, they're picking on that person? What do you think happened? They, they probably had like a little holy anger or something come up in them, right? Something rose up in them. It completely changed the entire feeling of the email, even though they described it in text. Okay? So, so here's the thing. When it comes to adding or adjusting content, okay, the thing that I've learned about tone of voice that I want to pass to you is that you should make it a motive. Okay? I want you to, I want you to read your email out loud. Okay? I want you to ask yourself, does this email make me feel anything? Okay? Do I feel something when I read this email? If not, revise it. What adjustments can you make so that the reader can sense energy and emotion? Is it authentic to your organization? Is it also aligned with the main message's value proposition? Here's the thing that I want to tell you guys about. Here's the thing I want to tell you about that first email that got that massive gain. Is that that particular organization is known for their, um, their, their personality. They have a whole video online. It just makes me laugh. It's not safe for work either. Um, you know, even, even a political policy organization, they talk about taxing sugary drinks, you know, and they're bleeping this and that. They know their audience. They know their audience is very passionate. And an email that doesn't have that in it is a fraud, okay? You know, like, my dog knows me based on the way I walk, the way I talk. Like, if an alien imposter came and cloned me, my dog would know it because I do things, okay, that, 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 that are not necessarily describable but are detectable, right? It's the same thing in email, okay? People need to see those clues. Okay, yeah, this is them. This is them. This is the, this is, or this is the issue. This is the cause. Does that make sense? They need to feel something with your email, right? They need to feel something. Now, let's go to the final one, okay? And you know what? I'm just going to give you a teaser on this one. I've got an entire one hour, I think an hour and a half session on this subject alone. But I just want to give you a little, little taste, okay? This is on the envelope. You guys know what the envelope is? This is getting the email open, okay? Subject line, all of that. Now, here's the thing. People think of email open. They think of subject line, right? Right? Well, wrong. <laughs> wrong, <laughs> okay? It is, not, it is not just the subject line that gets the email open, okay? Um, our friends at Litmus, okay, they, um, I, I love the guys at Litmus, I love Chad, uh, you know, he's the research director there. They've got a lot of data um, in the for-profit space, they also have some data in the not-for-profit space. But what they've discovered is that when they, when they studied how people open email and they studied how people mark spam and all of that, they noticed that only 34% look at the subject line first when deciding to open up the email. Only 34%. That means two-thirds are looking at other things in the email envelope to make the decision if this is an email they want to engage with, okay? Right? So here's the deal. You have to adjust each element of the email envelope. What I mean by that email envelope? From, right? We just talked about it. The from line, the subject line, okay? The preview text. We need to be able to adjust those things so that it authenticates that personal approach, it, it, it helps them to see, yeah, this could be a personal email, okay? Now, if you do that and then it's not a personal email, shame on you, okay? <laughs> shame on you, right? But if you're genuinely trying to write that personal email and you want them to feel like that's you, that, that you really have something genuine you want to share and you want them to give you a shot, you need to authenticate the fact that it is you in your envelope, okay? And we have an entire session on that. Let me just show you one case study as a clue.
okay? Here it is. Take a look, okay? Jim DeMint, Christy Fogarty, okay? What you don't know is that Jim DeMint is the president of the organization who's always sending emails every time to this thing. Christy Fogarty is not. This was a year-end campaign. Make this bold statement, checking in. Can you already get a clue, right? But let's just pretend that these were the same. Take a look at the preview text. Which one feels more authentic? Which one feels like it's more genuine? For those of you who voted version B, you're correct. 99% increase in opens. Okay, why? Well, you know the answer why, okay? Real people are white emails a certain way, and sometimes that means eliminating the preview text, making sure all this is not in there. That's why even, even they didn't even use a name, guys. Hey there. But listen, this sounds like some kind of message that I might write to somebody. So let me wrap everything up for you because we're running out of time. I want to get to some of your questions. Okay. Let me wrap it up to you this way. Okay. People will treat digital experiences like their experiences with real people. Okay. Whether you like it or not. BJ Fogg, in fact, he said it. He said, whether you like it or not, people are going to infer or they're going to believe, they're going to kind of humanize you either in a good way or a bad way. You don't have a choice because that's how people are. That's how they operate, okay? So even Dr. B.J. Fogg said, listen, you need to put social psychological cues that best represent yourself or your organization, okay? And it can be done in an ethical manner. He, that, that's his quote, right? So when it comes to writing an email, if you could only remember one thing, okay, if you could only remember one thing, if you say, John, I, you're going to get the slides, don't worry, you're going to get the video, but if you forget all of that, it's somewhere else, you got to write an email, you have to write it now, remember one thing, write your email like it is from a real person to a real person, and I promise you, you're going to see a difference, especially if you're trying to fundraise, right? Just do that. Now, how do I apply all this step by step? Let's do a quick review. First, choose an email design that mimics what you would send to a friend, very simply. Next, whoops, little animation problem there. We'll just go to number two. Start a salutation with their name if you have it, and if you can, if you can segment, any kind of a relevant acknowledgement. This is gonna go a long way to getting people to pay attention to the rest of your message, okay? When you acknowledge somebody, they acknowledge you. Next, before you make a request, Make sure there's enough copy to answer the question of why. If your goal is to attract somebody that is going to make a donation, or even for your, you know, for, the, for your nonprofit, for your for-profit friends, they're trying to sell something. If you want to attract somebody that's going to buy something, you better, you better be clear. You better make sure that you have enough answer why. And then when you make your call to action request, be clear about your desire and intentions. Okay? That's very important. These two things are very important for attracting that person that's going to give, okay? <clears throat> Next, for tone and voice, read your email out loud and then adjust it. So it sounds like it's from a human and here's the most important thing, it makes you feel something. Now don't go way overboard and don't go away, as they say, you know, right? Don't overact, don't, you know, don't, you know, you, you need to be aligned with how your organization is, right? But but do attempt to make them feel something like there is a human, just that there is a human writing this email. And you see those emails from me all the time. Guys, I write those emails because I want you to respond to them. I reply to your emails. If you, speak, if you send an email to me, I will reply to you, okay? That's what I want you to believe because I will do it. You want them to believe the same thing, that if you're gonna send them a message, that what it is that you're saying is important and you really believe it and it's worth their time. Finally, ensure that each aspect of your email envelope reflects that it is a real email from a real person. Just pay attention to that. And, and here's the thing, if you wanna know exactly how to do that, or maybe you've tried things and you haven't, it's worked before, you're really bad at writing subject lines, you know, we've got an entire like hour and a half session on that topic alone. And speaking of free things and free sessions, listen, what you've just watched is one session out of six, I believe, in our entirely new email fundraising optimization course and the best part about it is free. There's no pitches. There's nothing like that. It's totally free, guys. Now, I love Next After because, you know, if, if I were like somewhere else, like we would be charging like 600 or something for it because that's how much we charge for the courses I developed in other places. Um, this is totally free because we, because as Tim would say, we are a cause-based 
organization. We may not be a nonprofit, but we are cause-based, okay? We want to help unleash the most generous generation, and this is one of the ways in which we do it. We've got to help you, okay? In fact, I just recently read a report from another organization that said that fundraising is one of the most important issues, especially among medium and small-sized nonprofits. This is something that's going to help you, I promise you. An email, when it's text-only emails especially, that's something just about anybody can do. I can do that, okay? I can do that just from my inbox, okay? So you can activate that free course right here. Go there now and it's there, it's right there for you, okay? It's right there for you. Um, with that, we've got a few minutes left. I'd like to um, bring Nathan back on and, and help. Nathan, let's go ahead and pull out some questions and let's, let's answer questions from some folks that are on the line. I hope you found this helpful. I hope, you've, um, I hope you feel inspired when you work on your emails. So let's see if we can clear up anything that's a little bit foggy still in your head so that by the time you leave, you're like, okay, I'm ready to try something or I'm ready to get into that course. Nathan. Sure. Right. Well, the first response I have to that is, it's not about you, it's about your donor audience, okay? So let's think about the baby boomers for a minute. That's my first response to you. Don't ask yourself what you would do, ask yourself what your donors would do. If the majority of donors, the majority of giving is represented by that particular age group, they're reading the emails, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing that I would say, and we covered this a little bit more in the course, and believe it or not, what I've discovered through the research is that you think of email as some, as some drudgery kind of like task. And you know what? Tim thinks of email in that way. And we, we had a very healthy debate early on when we were doing this course about this very topic. But what I've discovered is that people, and you, you know this to be true, people don't just look at email as a duty. They look at it as an escape. Okay? I don't know if you've ever gone into your email to make it look like you're working because you needed a break, but I have. Everybody has. My wife has. She told me, she's like, yeah, I, I do see that all the time. Okay. And you know, I don't just go into my email looking, looking like I, I, I'm like looking for something that's going to lift me up. I'm looking for a quick win. Okay. So I'm scanning the emails for things that I like things. Okay. So the question is, is who's going to read a long email? Well, somebody that's looking for an escape. Somebody is in that mindset and they're like, okay. And the people that are most likely to donate to you are the ones that are going to read that. They're actually making the decision in the email. Because every time that I try and take somebody to a landing page, guess what? I lose that action. But when I take the time to write that email, you saw the experiment yourself. When I give enough reason, they're going to give. So don't look at yourself, look at the donor. And when you do look at yourself, don't look at yourself in the situation that you think of. Look at this, you know, typically. Think about the situations or the times when you used email as an escape or you've looked at it as like, I want to get a quick win. How many times have you sat through a boring presentation? Hopefully not this one. How many times have you sat through a boring presentation, right? And you just start looking at your email while you want an escape. You're like, oh, I need a stimulant, man. I just, what are you doing? You're reading email. You're giving more attention to the email than you actually would. Why? Because you need an escape. You need a quick win. And guess what? There's no better quick win than giving a chance, somebody a chance to act on their values. Does that make sense? Test it. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I, I'd hate to say it, but I, I don't I don't have any I don't think we've isolated that deep. Okay? You know, you have to keep in mind too that, you know, we're always looking for opportunities to isolate as, as deep as we can, especially in those variables. But here's what I would tell you. Um, 
Think of it this way. Would a real human send a bit.ly link? Or would a real human send, think of just, that's the hypothesis, right? You know what I would think based on the research now? No, a real human's not gonna send a bit.ly link. They're gonna send an ugly all the way link. Now you don't have to put, you know, the URL parameters, but hey, test it, okay? Because I, we haven't really isolated that enough to give you a definitive answer, but, but I will tell you that if I were to test that today or tomorrow, my hypothesis would be is that, you know, people, real people don't put in bit.ly links Therefore, um, you know, they may not trust them as much either because it's not clear on what the destination is. So I believe the people that want to give and the people that are going to want to give away their money or buy their products or whatever are more likely to trust a raw link where it shows the destination rather than a bit.ly link where it's still a mystery. But there are some bit.ly links in there, I think, in our research too. So don't just, don't just completely, you know, give it up. Oh boy, go, uh, here's, you just uh, go into the course. Um, we, you're gonna, here's, I'm gonna make a promise to you guys. Um, if you ever have trouble writing subject lines, like if you, if you ever feel like you're not like the wordsmith, um, I think we've got a little bit of a treat for you in the course. So um, there are generally two ways to write a subject line, um, right? There are um, two approaches. And a lot of what you're gonna find on the internet and from other marketers is, is, is particularly one approach, but there's another approach that doesn't necessarily require you to know a ton about the subject that you're writing about, but it, it allows you to still invite somebody into the conversation um, in a way in which they'll want to read it. It's not what I would call completely like clickbait. So in terms of sub writing subject, we've got a, we've got a kind of like a, a four or five, maybe it's, six, I forget how many steps, it's like a six step method that we put, put together. So in terms of subject lines, my best thing that I could recommend is just take some time now, like if you have time now or tonight, Go into that free course, go to session four. Go to session four and in the middle, you're gonna find a whole section on subject lines plus a whole step-by-step -step approach for, for writing them differently. Um, that'll, that'll help you, I, I hate to plug in, but you know, that's the best answer that I could give you in such a short amount of time. Does that make sense? And I'll just back step a couple of it so you have that link. There's that link again. So yeah, okay, so the, the question is, is, so we had, the only thing different in the email was the call to action. And the donation pages were the same, and yet we got a decrease in donations. Well, the reason for that is what I've discovered, and this is true of subject lines as well, is that information early on can have an effect on behavior downstream. Like it can attract a different kind of person or whatnot, right? So. If your call to action, let's just pretend for a moment, you've got group A and group B. Group A is highly motivated, but you know what? They don't like to just click stuff. They wanna know what you're getting at. And when they know what you're getting at and it's clear and they wanna get into it, when they get into it, they're gonna, they're gonna go all the way. You got group B, they're curious, okay? They're very curious, okay? Extremely curious. They just wanna know, they just kinda, they wanna see what's going on. They're less inclined to give, but they're more inclined to click. So when you change the call to action, you make it less obvious, you're gonna get more of this type and less of this type. This type is less likely to donate than this type. Therefore, that's how you can have such a big increase in clicks, but even a decrease in donations without changing the donation page because the type of person that you've attracted in was wrong. It's kind of like, um, you're, um, uh, it's kind of like if you sell fish, but you have a chicken on your billboard, okay? And people don't, don't look and, and see, you know, you're gonna have the chicken people coming in, they're like, oh, it's fish, bye. Even though you haven't changed it, you know, so change it to fish. You're gonna attract people to like fish. 
I know that sounds really silly, but I, I think that's, to me, like it's the easiest way for me to understand it myself, right? So the call to action is the billboard. It's the thing they look at to say, okay, what's this about? Is this for me? Okay, and when it's too loose, when it's too ambiguous, when it's too like not clear, they're like, eh, it's not for me. That's how, does that make sense? Chicken fish, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Right. Yes, thank you. Right. Yeah. No, just binge. Like Netflix. Night net like Netflix. Just binge. Just all the way. <laughs> yes. See you next week, man.